Local support for this program is provided by Maine Public Member Contributions and by Nemec, a workers' compensation insurance company celebrating more than 25 years of serving Maine employers and their employees. Dedicated to a balanced workers' compensation system that reduces injuries and keeps costs down. Memic.com. AARP Maine, advocating in Maine and Washington to ensure Mainers over 50 and their families have a voice on the issues that matter. Learn more at aarp.org me. The Law Offices of Joe Bornstein. From Kittery to Caribou, the Joe Bornstein team is committed to serving injured and disabled Mainers in locations convenient to them. Learn more at joebornstein.com. Welcome to Maine Public's Your Vote 2020 Second District Congressional Primary Debate among the Republicans vying for that seat. I'm Jennifer Rooks, and for the next hour, we are going to hear from the three candidates vying to challenge incumbent Democrat Jared Golden in November. First, let's meet the candidates. Adrian Bennett is well known as the former press secretary for Governor Paul LePage. She has worked also as a television news reporter, director of policy and legislative affairs at the Department of Labor, and as a bank marketing director, she lives in Bangor. Eric Brakey is a former state senator who was the Republican nominee for U.S. Senate in 2018. In 2012, he worked as state director for the Ron Paul campaign and headed up the Liberty PAC. He lives in Auburn. Dale Crafts served in the Maine House of Representatives for eight years. He is a businessman who has founded or managed several small businesses, including a go and postal franchise and a pre-owned auto dealership. He lives in Lisbon. We are going to start off in alphabetical order with one minute opening statements. In the interest of fairness, though, we want to make a note that we will reshuffle over the last hours, the next hour, so that each candidate will have a different chance to go first, second, and third. We're going to start, though, with Adrian Bennett. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you to MPBN for hosting this. I know it's a lot of work, so we appreciate it, and especially an hour. I'm running for Congress because I'm a Mainer, and we know what that means. We have grit, we're fighters, and we're tough. I'm a fighter, and I'm very concerned with the direction our state and our nation is headed. In high school, when my mom left me, she moved to Ohio and I stayed in Old Town. That's where I graduated on my own. I had my daughter at 20 years old and I had to put myself through college. And so I did that. And then I worked three jobs to make ends meet because that's what we do as Mainers. When I go to Washington, I'm going to bring my strong work ethic with me and I'm going to partner with President Trump to pass the America First agenda. I'm also going to fight for our main values. We're going to build the wall, fix a broken healthcare and welfare system. I'll protect innocent life. We're going to stop the gun grabbers in their tracks. And we're going to drain the swamp, including the career politicians, and break through that fake news because you deserve the truth. And again, it's those main values that I'm going to be fighting for, and I hope that I earn your vote. Eric Brakey. Well, hello, my name is Eric Brakey, and I'm running for Congress because I believe in a free Maine and a free America, and the Washington machine is screwing over Maine people. They're stealing our money, destroying our Constitution, and sending our kids off to die in Afghanistan for a third decade in a row. Our Maine ancestors would never have tolerated this. 245 years ago, they grabbed their axes and pitchforks in Machias and charged a British warship to win our freedoms. What happened to us? When are we going to start fighting back, or are we just going to sit here and take it? My opponents, Jared, Dale, and Adrian, are three of a kind. Corporate socialists who support stealing trillions from the American people and handing it out in corporate welfare. They pay lip service to the Constitution while supporting the Unconstitutional Patriot Act. They feign support for our soldiers while sending them off to fight in never-ending wars. They wrap themselves in President Trump's flag while accepting support from the very swamp he's trying to drain. No more of this. I'm Eric Brakey. I support our president. Let's free Maine and let's free America. Dale Crafts. Well, thank you for having me and uh, thank you, Jennifer, and all you guys are doing for us. And thank you for the audience that's watching. Thanks for tuning in. 
I, uh, I'm Dale Cross from Lisbon, as you said, and I'm a family man. I got six children and 14 grandchildren. I've been a businessman for over 40 years. I come from a business family. And you know what? Uh, back in 1983, I was out on my motorcycle uh, delivering a pot to my dad's business. And uh, hey, an elderly man who didn't mean to, but he turned in front of me and drove me off the road. And uh, my bike went airborne and I ended up uh, breaking my back, becoming a paraplegic. My, my wonderful, godly grandmother taught me to be an overcomer. And my life has just been amazing. They told me I wouldn't have any more children. I had one and five more came. But ever since then, I've served uh, you know, the legislature. I've served my local town as a as councilman. And you know what? I got Paul LePage's endorsement, Sean Moody's endorsement, 50 current and former legislators, 76 business owners, and 60 sportsmen, 30 firefighters, and 24 pastors. And I just ask you to go to my site, dalecraftsforcongress.com, and look why they have, they have endorsed me. Thank you. Our first question in this debate, the first set of questions, will be front burner issues. These questions have been um, come up with by the main public news team. And we're going to start. The first question will be going to Eric Brakey first. Eric, the United States recently surpassed 3 million cases of coronavirus with more than 132,000 deaths, one quarter of all the cases in the world. What is your assessment of how the federal government is handling the coronavirus pandemic? And what measures would you support as a US congressperson to respond not only to the current COVID-19 crisis, but also prepare for any future pandemic? The federal bureaucracy in Washington, D.C. stood in the way in the very early moments of this crisis when we needed private innovators to be able to act. The, the CDC stood in the way of private testing, saying that we had to use their own in-house developed test kits, and those test kits failed. Uh, it cost us an entire month when we could have been preparing for this crisis. So we need to fire the bureaucrats standing in the way and we need to let private innovators innovate. Now, I will say that while cases are going up, that's frankly, that has a lot to do with testing being more available than it ever has been. The death rate and the hospitalization rate have been falling dramatically. And, and the cases that we see are concentrated to mostly today in low risk populations of young and healthy people. Frankly, that's where we want the cases to be because th that's how we build our herd immunity as a society. We need to protect our most vulnerable, like our seniors and those with underlying health conditions. But we also need young and healthy people to go about their lives and build herd immunity. That's the only way we get through this. Eric, I wanna ask you about facial coverings or masks. Do you wear a facial covering and mask when you go into local businesses uh, and other public places and why or why not? If a local business wants me to, I believe in private property rights and I'm going to respect the wishes of private property owners. But ultimately, when I'm going about my day to day life out in the outside, out in the sunshine where the UV light kills the coronavirus like that, frankly, I think that these uh, mask mandates are, are pretty ridiculous. And I was also I was speaking with Androscoggin County Sheriff uh, recently. Uh, who, who pointed out it was actually it was about the stay at home orders. And he said, you know, when it was first suggested that people stay at home and it was voluntary, people tended to stay at home. But the moment it became mandatory, people stopped doing it. And I think that says something actually pretty good about who we are as main people, that we don't just take orders from government bureaucrats who try to boss us around. We should be, if, if they want us to wear masks, they should give us the information why, and we should be able to make our own decisions. But if they start mandating this and telling us what we have to do, we're not gonna follow it. That's not in our nature as main people. All right, we're going to turn now to Dale Crafts. Dale Crafts, I won't repeat the whole question, but I will ask you what you think. Uh, what is your assessment of how the federal government is handling the coronavirus pandemic? And what would you do differently? Well, certainly this was um, something that caught our government off guard. And uh, I don't think we were prepared very well at all. And I think that we ought to learn from this uh, for the future so that we can make sure that we are better prepared. Now, I think the government's job is to inform us about the pandemic and to let us know how contagious it is in ways that we can protect ourselves and ways that we can be sure that we're safe. But you know what? They shouldn't overstep their boundaries by mandating things that uh, stops our constitutional right to be free people. You know, I, I certainly respect, especially the elderly, people that are vulnerable. And when there's times that I have to put a mask on, I will if, if I'm making somebody uncomfortable. You know, I take care of myself, I feel that I'm healthy, and I think that other people ought to be able to have that choice. Now, we ought to be respectful of other people at all times, but the federal government needs to prepare in the future 
so that we don't shut a whole economy down and make shutting the economy down the the economy down worse than the, than the, the virus itself. And that's what we've done, especially here in Maine. One size does not fit, fit all. So that needs to change. Well, so I, I want to be clear here. Do you feel as though wearing a mask is a different than, say, mandating wearing a seatbelt? Yes, I do. I do very much. So. All you right. Know, and, yes. uh, Adrian, I'll, I'll ask you the same question. How did the federal government handle the coronavirus pandemic? And what would you have done differently or tried to do differently as a congressperson? Sure, I, I will actually answer your question. I do feel that the Trump administration did the best they could. They were handed some really bad cards from the Obama administrations in terms of uh, lack of a stockpile and preparedness. We didn't have a plan. And of course, this was unprecedented. And we have a president who banned all travel from China very early on. That was critical to flattening the curve. And we had a president who implemented 15 days of guidelines, and we adhered to those. However, at the state level, we have a dictator in our governorship right now, our Governor Mills, who has continued a civil emergency. And she's only doing that because she wants federal bailout money. And we don't even know if that's going to come to the state. What we need to focus on are businesses right now, our economy. I advocated early on for a regionally conscious approach to opening and our businesses were forced to shut down for far longer than they needed to. And that resulted in many closures. So uh, from a state perspective, I think it was a horrible job. I think on the federal level, um, it was better. I did support um, the first coronavirus package that President Trump put forward. And I know one of my opponents, Eric Brakey, he did not support that. All but right, Adrian, yeah, I wanna ask you the same follow-up question that I've asked um, um, Eric, which is, are you wearing a mask in public, especially when you go into businesses in your area? I do not, and uh, I will say though this, my father, he has COPD, and I haven't been able to visit him for quite some time. I use common sense. If I have a sniffle, if I have a cold, I don't see my dad. And I wait until I'm healthy to do so because I don't want to jeopardize those who have compromised immune systems. I do want to be respectful of others, but I believe that we need to have a choice. All right, well, our next question has to do with the Black Lives Matter movement across the nation. An estimated 15 to 26 million people have protested as part of the Black Lives Matter movement, calling attention to institutional racism and demanding change. Do you think that there is institutional racism? And if so, what should be done about it? Dale Crafts. Well, you know, I look at that and it's too bad that this country has to be so divided. Um, I look at the race issue as I'm a Christian and I believe that God created the uh, human race and there's only one race and it's people that want to decide and divide people and it's simply a different color of skin. So I really struggle with what's going on in this country. Yes, when we come to the police officer issue, like I've always said, there's always a few bad apples, but I think it's a very, very small percentage of officers. I think that we could have more training and better ways to uh, handle people in these very difficult situations. And so that we don't have people, you know, somebody reacting in a way that somebody gets hurt, but learn to do a better job to subdue these people, get them handcuffed and get them off to jail or whatever needs to take place without anybody getting hurt or killed. I know we can always do a better job. That's who we are as Americans. We always figure out a better way and I know we will. Uh, you talk about, uh, Dale, you talk about doing a better job as Americans, doing a better way. Some of the things that have been offered are, for example, eliminating mandatory sentencing. And there are other criminal reform, ju criminal justice reform measures uh, proposed. Do you support any of those? And if so, be specific about which ones. Well, I'd have to take a look at them. Uh, the proposal itself is like legislation. You know, you you have to go uh, before committees and learn all about the issue and, uh, and know the details of that. I'd have to see the details of these proposals and I have not seen them, but I am always open to looking and learning and, uh, and, and at least having the uh, open mind to consider these, 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 uh, all right, Adrian Bennett, I'll put the question to you. Do you believe there is institutional racism in our country? And if so, what needs to happen? 
I think what we need to do is have better conversations at the local level and our local communities need to get involved in this nationwide discussion. Obviously what happened, and I've said this time and time again, the murder of George Floyd, it is a tragedy. I think we can all come to that consensus and that there needs to be justice served to those who committed this uh, heinous act. But we have seen since then such violence that you know ri rioters looters the burning of buildings destruction of property and that has led into this conversation about racism and what we really need to do is come together as communities talk to each other ask questions i know i have friends who are black and i've reached out to them since this whole discussion has taken place and we need to not be afraid of asking questions of others and being open to different ideas and, and again, just having those conversations with people without being labeled right off the bat as a bigot or a racist because you're asking a question. And I wanna ask you about criminal justice reform measures as well. Do you um, support eliminating mandatory sentencing or any other specific measures? Well, specifically, you know, one of my opponents, Senator Brakey, he has brought up a bill that would have actually uh, banned cash bail. And it would have been applicable to people who are looting, rioting, the destruction of property, people who have committed robbery, bur burglary, and uh, crimes of that nature. Uh, that's something that I certainly do not um, agree with or support. Um, but I am a candidate and a person who has uh, very uh, strong views uh, regarding law and order. We are a nation of law and order. I respect and I will always defend our police and uh, all law enforcement officers. Eric Brakey, do you believe there is institutional racism in this country? And if so, what needs to happen in Congress to change that? Well, first of all, I'd like some extra time to respond to that. But to answer your additional your question, I do think that when you look at the outcome of our criminal justice system across the country, there are some racial outcomes that certainly um, may be unintended, but do need to be addressed. I mean, for example, white kids and black kids use drugs at similar rates, and yet our jails are disproportionately filled with people of color. And that's something that should be addressed. And thankfully, we have a president, Donald Trump, who's done more for criminal justice reform than any president in recent memory. In fact, he signed the First Step Act into law, which repealed some of the uh, tough on crime policies that Joe Biden put in in the 90s, putting people into jail for nonviolent victimless crimes. So so I have been a leading voice for criminal justice reform in, in, a, in Augusta, uh, and I will support President Trump in further criminal justice reform in Washington, DC. I will say that when we're looking at reforms across the country, main police officers are among the best in America and should be used as a model in other states. All right, and Adrian mentioned the cash bail bill. Uh, if you'd like to talk about that a little bit more, Eric, and any other specific reform measures you support. Sure, this is a reform measure that I worked on with local county sheriffs on because our jails are overcrowded. And frankly, what Adrian Bennett is saying about the proposal is just completely untrue. We're talking about people who have non, certain nonviolent uh, nonviolent offenses where it is a determined that they are neither a flight risk nor a risk to themselves or others. Right now, our jails in Maine are overcrowded with people who are there who can't come up with $50 of cash bail. It comes at an expense to the taxpayers $100 a day and that's why our jails are so overcrowded. So there are smart ways we can look at criminal justice reform. And the fact that Adrian Bennett wants to play politics with this issue really just shows that she's out of touch with the problems that our, face, that our state is facing. All right, going to our third broad question. Uh, this will go to Adrian Bennett first. You have all expressed your support for President Donald Trump, but you all also have your own mind. In what ways do you disagree with the president? On what issues would you vote against him, Adrian? Sure, well, I'd also like to respond to Senator Brakey's, um, what he said um, in, in his rebuttal, but we can get to that in just a few moments. So yes, I am uh, an ardent supporter of President Trump unapologetically, and I worked on his campaigns uh, in 2016 when he was the nominee. And I've since worked with Vice President Pence as well out on uh, the trail. Uh, as recently as this past fall when he was advocating for USMCA. Um, if you agree 100% of the time with any political candidates, with any politician, 
then something's probably wrong. So no, there are some areas we I'm sure will disagree. I do have my own, my own mind. And I think many Mainers remember me in Governor LePage's office uh, as his press secretary. I didn't always agree with what uh, he said all of the time, but I was a voice of reason, voice of clarification often. And uh, you know, I'll be the same when I go to Congress. I'll be an ally to President Trump, but it doesn't mean you need to agree 100% of the time. And Adrian, do you agree with the president that much of the news reported about him is a hoax and that the press is the enemy of the people? I think there's a lot of fake news. I've been in media before. I've been a bureau chief and reporter, and I took great pride in people not knowing which side of the aisle that I was on. And I see that we have a lot of bias right now in many media outlets across our nation and here in Maine, and that you know, his, his tactic is to go to the people directly. And I agree with that. You know, we need to uh, be able to get the facts out to people. And, um, you know, I do believe that there is fake news out there. Yes. All right, Eric Brakey, I'm going to turn to you uh, on what issues or what positions do you disagree with the president? Well, first of all, let me say, as some folks know, I haven't always been a supporter of Donald Trump. Uh, I remember back in the primary when he and my candidate, Senator Rand Paul, were going at it very head to head, a lot of trash talk going on. I remember defending my my candidate, Rand Paul, quite a bit. But when Donald Trump won the primary, I became a big supporter of his, and I've been a supporter of his ever since. I've actually the only candidate in this race who's worked with his administration to pass tax reform and right to try and defended him against the witch hunt from the very beginning. There are certainly some policies where I disagree with him. I disagreed with his hiring of John Bolton as national security advisor. I thought he was a snake that he was allowing into the administration. And I think today there's probably no one in the world who agrees with me more on that assessment than Donald Trump himself. I think that supporting the president doesn't mean you know kissing the ground he walks on and saying that he can do no wrong. It doesn't mean being a yes man. It means actually supporting him enough to be able to speak up when you think he's making a mistake, when you think that he's uh, hiring people like John Bolton who shouldn't be hired. And so I support the president, I support him enough to be able to tell him when I think he's making a mistake. All right, and I'll ask you the same question I asked Adrian. Do you believe that uh, much of the news reported about President Trump is a hoax and that the press, uh, members of the press corps are enemies of the people? Well, I can say with all certainty that CNN is the enemy of the people. I have seen so many times through these last four years You'll have a, a report come out from unnamed anonymous sources attacking the president, and it always comes out within a month or two that it was completely false. But they never apologize. They never go back and, and, uh, and retract it. They just move on to the next fake news story, and we've been dragged through this through the entire presidential administration. We had two years of Russia collusion, Russia collusion. Uh, it took, they took us through an entire midterm election that put Nancy Pelosi and Jared Golden in power, telling us that, that our president was involved in Russian collusion. And we only found out after the election, they came out and told us, whoops, it turns out that there was nothing there, it was all fake. Well, you know what? The media is, is abusing the American people in this way. They have been lying about our president and I've got the president's back. All right, we're gonna to turn to Dale Crafts. Dale, uh, what policies or issues do you disagree with President Trump? Well, I can tell you that uh, I met President Trump in Portland. I had the privilege when he was uh, in a primary himself to go down there and open in prayer for President Trump. And I admire that his stance for religious freedom and doing all he can for, there's a lot of discrimination and things going on, I think, around the country to Christians. Uh, and so I admire him for that. I admire him for his business ability. As a businessman, I plan on going down there and partner alongside President Trump to bring this economy back. Hey, this economy was booming because he, he, he put policies in places places to uh, get this economy going. And I believe that he'll do the same. I am a fiscal hawk. I am a conservative, despite uh, what Eric Brakey's people put out. Uh, it's not true. I was more, more conservative uh, when I served in the House than Eric Brakey. So uh, let's just clear that up for one thing. But I would, I am very concerned about the national debt and the, and, the, and the budget shortfall. And I would be a fiscal hawk down there to do all I could to uh, to balance a budget and get this, this country on a, on a, a solid foot financially. Dale, and the same follow-up question that the others um, uh, were asked, uh, what do you think of President Trump's words about members of the press corps? Well, I mean, if anybody that would have any type of open mind, open mind, just watch the news. 
There's so much slant that sometimes it makes me sick to my stomach. There is a lot of fake news. Look at the collusion. Look at the impeachment. Look what's going on now in our country. You know, they want to take, you know, the the, the, the riots and stuff going and, and try to paint him to be a racist himself. You know, the fake news just doesn't like Donald Trump. And, and you can go with MSNBC, NBC, ABC, CNN. I mean, they just don't like the guy. And they slant everything. And so, yes, I believe that there's... Uh, Fake news. They want to take him out. The Democrat Party wants to take him out. And uh, and so, yeah. All right. Now on to some questions that have been designed for each candidate specifically. These have been crafted by our news staff. You will each have one minute to respond. Starting with a question for Eric Brakey. Back in 2018, when you challenged Angus King for U.S. Senate, you suggested in a Twitter post that if King was reelected, he would repopulate Maine with Latino immigrants. He got reelected. It's been two years. What do you have to say about that claim then and now? Well, those were just Angus King's own words, and I support a, a I support border security and a strong immigration policy. You know what? Though I want to respond to what Dale Crafts just said. You know, the fact is, I don't know how anyone can claim to be a fiscal conservative when they supported the biggest spending bill in all of human history, two trillion dollars passing through Congress without even a vote of Congress on Nancy Pelosi's say so alone. Both of my Republican primary opponents supported that. It was a rotten deal that took. Or an average of sixteen thousand dollars from every single American Erica, taxpayer I get back. gave them a twelve hundred dollar check and said that it should be well and good. So I would like to get back to the question I asked you, and that and question is about what you said in your uh, it tweeted at Angus King. You said you used his own words, so you're I, saying that I've Angus King said that he was going to repopulate Maine with Latino immigrants. I've answered your question, and now I'm using my time to address some attacks that have been made against me. Dale Crafts is a big spender who supported the uh, $2 trillion spending bill going through Congress on Nancy Pelosi's say so alone. He supports trillion dollar wars overseas that are not just wasting our money, but also wasting the lives of our soldiers. I say it's time to come home from Afghanistan. It's time to come home from Iraq. It's stop, time to stop fighting these never ending pointless wars. All right, and we're going to move on. President Donald Trump in America first foreign policy. Dale Crafts, you are known as a man of deep conviction to your Christian faith. You've already talked about that during this hour. And also as very loyal to President Trump. The president often acts in ways that seem to run counter to your values. How do you square your support of a man whose personal behavior is so contrary to your beliefs? Well, his personal behavior has been reported by a lot of the fake news also. And you know what, everybody is not a perfect human being, including myself, because as you grow older as a Christian, as you learn, you become you become a better person and you learn from that. So I'm sure President Trump, who I pray for daily, um, is trying to do his very best. He's probably made mistakes like anybody else, but I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt. And I wanna address Eric Brakey. All he has done in this campaign is attack, 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 attack. He can't stand on his own record. He can't get the endorsement he needs. Uh, behind him. If you look at all the endorsements that I have, including the former governor Paul LePage and Sean Moody, if I was such a big spender, then why would I get all these endorsements that he don't have? You know, he just wants to attack, attack, attack. And you know what? His attack's not working so well because he's on the bottom of the polls. He's now he's trying to do all he can to attack Adrian and I right now because he's got to get his numbers up because he's losing. All righty, Adrian Bennett. In January, your campaign supported an appearance by Michelle Malkin, a commentator whose extreme views and support for a group of Holocaust design deniers has prompted some conservative groups to cut ties with her. Both of you and Dale Crafts argued at the time that Malkin's views are protected under the First Amendment. The First Amendment also protects freedom of association. Why would you want to associate with someone with Malkin's views? Well, I certainly have had personal conversations with Michelle Malkin, and I, yes, I believe in our First Amendment. And she is not a Holocaust denier. She it really is not. She got associated because of somebody else's words that she refused to denounce. So this is what the left does, the radical left. Instead of going on policy, they will turn to personal attacks. And that's exactly what this is. I've been called anti-Semitic. And again, this is what the left does. And no, I, I 
again, like I said, I believe in free speech. We worked on five different venues. So Michelle Malkin could come to Maine and she could have a voice and talk about her book, Open Borders. It was about illegal immigration. And I believe that we need to put Mainers first. We need to take care of our veterans. We need to take care of our seniors, those who are most vulnerable with developmental and intellectual disabilities. And illegal immigrants are cutting in line. That is a view that she shares with me. And I was proud to be the only candidate quite frankly, to really help get, okay. find a venue for her because she was kicked, being kicked out because of this cancel culture that we have across our nation. Now we have the chance for the candidates to ask one question of each other. Candidates will have a minute to respond. Dale Crafts, you may start by asking Adrian Bennett a question. Actually, the question's for both my opponents. And the question is, if you lose the primary, what's your plans after? Well, that's, that's easy for me um, because I'm a businesswoman. I know that you have touted and some other folks who have endorsed you that you're the only businessman, Dale. We've become friends throughout this campaign and um, I'm a businesswoman, I'm a realtor. Uh, you're in real estate as well. So I will continue to build my book of business and I will be involved with politics. I truly believe that the Republican party is the wave of the future and that our ideas need to be shared with more people. And I'm excited for where we're going as a state, as a country. I am confident that we are doing very well in this uh, race and that I will be able to defeat Jared Golden. Again, I've got to remind people that we have got ranked choice voting in play and we've got to defeat Jared Golden by 51%. I'm the only candidate who can do that. But I do, I have worked in the private sector, um, unlike uh, another person in this race. And, and uh, I'll go back to the private sector if need be but still be involved with politics. Adrian, it's your chance to ask a question of Eric Brakey. Sure, um, over the past few weeks, dangerous mobs and far left groups, they're running our streets and they're causing mayhem and destruction. It's an absolute mess. Uh, the rioting, destroying our cities, threatening our history. It's madness. Um, you, and I'm going to bring this up again because I feel it's important. In the main legislature, you introduced a bill that would have allowed those arrested for robbery and vandalism to get out of jail for free with no cash bail. That was the premise of this bill. Under your bill, criminals who are committing robbery, arson, vandals who are looting would get out of jail free. How do you defend this radical position that would release Antifa members and those who topple statues without bail? You know, I've already addressed this question and frankly, Adrian needs to read the bill for herself because these are people who are assessed as being not a danger to themselves or others and not a flight risk. But you know what, I actually, I have in my pocket right here, speaking about a lot of negative campaigning, I have in my pocket here an email I received from a member of Adrian Bennett's campaign just yesterday. Uh, it outlines actually, um, it, it suggests that I should go after Dale Crafts and outlines uh, some of his past divorces and past failed business uh, business ventures. And you know what? What I say to this, I say, Adrian, if you want to run a smear campaign against Dale Crafts, you should do it yourself. All right. I'm, I'm going to certainly contrast with all of you on the issues that matter. But if you want to run a smear campaign against Dale, like you run a smear campaign against me through this race, lying about me in the most personal ways, uh, then frankly, you should do your own dirty work. No, and if I may, Jennifer, Seconds. there's no on my campaign, on our staff, who would ever advocate for okay. uh, going negative against Dale Craft. Eric, That's it's your chance to ask a question okay. of Dale. Oh, it's my turn. All yeah, right. your turn to ask a question of Dale. Dale, uh, during your t your second term in the main in the main House of Representatives, Republican. Republicans were in control of the House, the Senate, and the governorship, and you sponsored constitutional carry. Your constitutional carry bill under ideal circumstances failed in committee 11 to 2, and you never even got a roll call vote in the House or the Senate. I came in and when Democrats controlled the House, whipped up support from thousands of grassroots Maine people, and passed it through with huge majorities. Um, why did your constitutional carry bill fail so miserably when Republicans were in control of everything in 2011? Well, I can just tell you this, Eric, that I've been working on constitutional carry and uh, gun issues before you was even a resident, a resident of Maine. Okay, all, all the way back at my church that I founded that President Trump came and spoke in, in Maine, uh, we had constitutional 
classes for people to carry in our church because people wanted to. I had uh, Paul Volley and Mark Finks come into our church and teach the Constitution in our church. So, you know, you want to go after me on that? I've been an advocate for that. You know what? I've been uh, uh, carrying guns. I have a gun collection. I have a shooting range out back. I personally carry. So if you want to try to, to uh, go after me on that, I've always told you that you did a good job by getting the sponsors. I helped you with that. I helped people get on that list to sponsor. I talked to people. We were, it was a team, team effort to get constitutional carry. And you know what? It started way back. And you think you came in and you just want to take all the credit. And no, Eric, I just wish it wasn't always just me, me, I, I. You know what? You are a friend, but that gets old after a while. All right, and it turned this around, Dale. It's your chance to ask Eric a question. Well, I asked that question and I want to know what Eric's going to do. Um, if he doesn't win the primary, because I've not seen much he's done in the past. Well, you know, it's funny, Dale, you've said before that I'm not running on my accomplishments, but I think I'm actually the only person running on any accomplishments. I haven't heard you point out in your entire, from your eight years in Augusta, any accomplishments. I think if you had them, you would have told us some of them by now. Uh, I got constitutional carry passed, welfare reform and right to try. And when I say that I did it, I mean, I did it along with thousands and thousands of grassroots main people. We all did it together. We all held the politicians accountable in Augusta. And I'm gonna work with people across Maine and across America to hold the politicians accountable in Washington, D.C. And should someone else win this primary? Well, I guess I would have to stand by and watch Jared Golden win a, sec a second term, which would be a real shame because I'm the only candidate in this race who can beat Jared Golden. I'm the only candidate with the message of freedom that speaks to who we are as main people. I'm the only candidate with the grassroots support, uh, supporters and, and leaders in every single county across the second district who've knocked on 35,000 doors and made over 50,000 phone calls. I'm the only candidate who can raise the funds to get the message out from the grassroots uh, freedom network across Maine and across America. So I guess it would be a pretty sad year to see Jared Golden win a second term. Adrian Bennett, it's your chance to ask a question of Dale Crafts. Sure, well, I will say, look at Eric Brakey. He is a career politician. That's what he wants to do. And I think that's his only game plan after this because he hasn't worked in the private sector like Dale and myself have. We've worked a variety of jobs. And um, so he, he wants this so badly because it's all he's ever known. Um, so Dale Crafts, I oppose the CMP corridor. I've spoken with hundreds of, Maine, hundreds of Mainers who are concerned about this project and believe it is a bad deal for Maine. Originally, you agreed with me and with local communities who oppose this project. However, you recently changed your position to support the corridor. Um, does it have anything to do with CMP consultants or lobbyists involved in your campaign? Well, Adrian, I don't know where you heard that, but that's not true at all. I've never once made a statement that I support it. Never once. And uh, in the news media reported, uh, is I signed the uh, petition to get it to the ballot so that people could choose on which way they want to go. So that's what I support. I support the main people and what their will is on the corridor. So what you just said is not true. And I don't know where you where you got that from. But uh, so it's not true. And I'll stick to that. And uh, that's my position. All right. I, I want to follow up. Dale, what is your position on the CMP corridor? Do you support it or oppose it? Well, listen, the CMP corridor is a, a, a major project that the PUC has approved. Now, the main people are asking, or the, this petition is asking the main people whether they, they can go back to, the, to have the PUC reconsider this. And so that's what I support. I support the will of the people. I'm going to Congress to do the congressional work down there. So I support the people's will. But there are some federal permits involved with this and in Congress, you would have to deal with it. So I'm just wondering specifically if you support this project, Dale. No, I don't. All right, Eric Brakey, your chance to ask a question of Adrian Bennett. I thought I did already. Oh gosh, do I have this wrong? I had Eric Brakey, who have I forgotten? I'm happy to ask another question. <laughs> yeah, I have Eric Brakey ask Adrian Bennett a question here. You asked Dale Crafts a question before. All right. Um, well, um, Adrian, you know, you recently, you just attacked me for, you've said that I have never held a job in the private sector, which frankly isn't true. I've worked a job actually every day since uh, 
with the exception of being a full-time student since I turned 14 years old. Uh, but you know, if you really want to have a, a battle on on resume, can you explain to people why you were fired from your last three jobs? Why you say that you're a realtor, but there's no record of you ever having sold a house? Can you tell us why when you were let go from by Governor LePage's office, you ran to the media, you threw him under the bus, you called him an extremist, and you said that the party needed to move closer to the middle. What did you no, mean when you said that we needed to move closer to okay. the middle? What Let's did you mean by that? Answer. So, so I, I do need to address this because on this campaign trail from the beginning in October when we all announced, I haven't heard anything about your personal background or work in the private sector, Eric. And this is concerning because I've been very open and honest with Maine people. And I've talked to thousands of Mainers about how, where, why I, I grew up here in Maine and what has formed my principles, my morals and my integrity. I challenge you to open up about your personal story and your work history. And Dale has done this too, yet you continue to refuse to be open and honest with Mainers. When I left the LePage administration, I was recruited by a community bank. I went to that community bank and I restructured their marketing department and that was successful. That team is still there and I still talk with uh, my teammates who are there and uh, they're doing a fantastic job. You know, we in an administration, as you should know, we only have a limited period of time. And so a year and a half out, I started looking. And again, I was recruited by a community bank. All right. I have three what sales. Did you mean, what did you Adrian, mean? Adrian, thank you, you very much. No, we're going to go to a quick break now. Thank you. Election Day is July 14th. And Maine Public's Your Vote 2020 online resource offers important information about the candidates and issues you will be voting on. Find interviews with the candidates vying for their party's nominations for the U.S. House and Senate, information on the bond issues on the July ballot, and re-watch these debates in our on-demand archive. Go to mainepublic.org slash your vote. And welcome back. You're watching Maine Public's Your Vote 2020 Second District Congressional Republican Primary Debate. We're going to turn now to a couple questions posed by members of our audience. We want to thank everybody who took the time to submit a question. The first question comes from Richard McSherry. His question is this, current projections show that the Social Security Trust Fund will have to reduce benefits sometime in the 2030s to remain solvent. Should there be an increase in the maximum wage that is taxed to help offset this shortfall? Should the retirement age be increased? Should means testing be adopted? Should the program be abolished and be allowed people be allowed to invest on their own with earnings that now go to the social security tax. We're going to start now with Dale Crafts. Dale, go ahead. Well, one thing we have to do is, is a, is a nation. Uh, if we're going to pay our bills, we got to keep our promises to the people that have paid into social security their whole lives, their whole working lives. So we have to figure out that has to be a priority. People have depended on their whole life to get to that retirement age, and we can't take that away from them. And you know, I have a problem when we keep increasing the age, you know, further because I think that's that's not keeping the promise. So how do we do? How do we make it solvent? Well, we got to grow the economy. I think uh, President Trump, we got to get him reelected because his whole um, business plan of taking on China and trying to get fair trade. We've had lopsided trade forever. We've been ripped off, like he said, forever. So I think that once we get fair trade around the world that he's worked on, we're gonna grow this economy, factories are gonna come back and we're gonna create enough revenue to keep our promises. It's gonna take a business mind to put a business plan together to, to make uh, social security solvent. And I do believe that we ought to have a portion of our social security that we paid in if we want to invest it and get a return on that and grow our social security even more. All right, Adrian Bennett, the question was about Social Security. What are your thoughts and what would you do as a congressperson to address the impending shortfall? Well, certainly our spending has run rampant over the years and uh, we, are, we are in debt and we do not need to cut anything in Social Security. Those people have been uh, depending on that and they should be receiving that. However, I don't feel like I am ever going to be able to receive Social Security. I'm okay with that because 
at a very young age, when I went into the workforce at 20 years old, I started a 401k. I also have Roth IRAs and other investment means. So these are things that we need to um, educate our young people about and encourage them to save earlier. Now, our Social Security, I, I know your uh, viewer, he, he asked several different questions there. Um, but we need to encourage uh, more financial solvency uh, through education and more options for people. We can't uh, cut our Social Security, though, at this point in time. We need to find a way to uh, pay out to the people who have paid in for so long. All right, Eric Brakey, your stance on the Social Security's impending shortfall. This is a big problem and we're in this mess because people were forced to pay into Social Security with the promise that it would be there. And then tax and spend politicians reached into Social Security to fund their own pet projects in Washington, D.C. So we have to shore up this program to maintain our promises to our seniors and those close to retirement who've planned their lives and their retirements around this program being there. I would shore up the program by cutting spending elsewhere in the budget. For example, ending the trillion dollar wars overseas, ending the billions of dollars in foreign aid we send to countries that burn our flag. Let's bring that money home. Let's invest in domestic priorities like shoring up social security. And then in the long run for younger people like myself, we can look at reforms like means testing, like raising the age, but for those who are currently collecting and those who are close to collecting, we have to make sure that we shore up the program to maintain our promises to our seniors. All right, the next question will go to Adrian first. Adrian, what is your plan for ending the bitter divisiveness that has essentially crippled our government? This is from Andrew Powell. Well, Andrew, it's a really good question. And we have to have the ability to have conversations with people from across the aisle. And I have friends who are Democrat, independents, Republicans, and you know it really shouldn't matter what party we are affiliated with. We need to find common ground. And I'm a communicator. And you know when I was a reporter, I took a lot of pride in people not knowing if I was a Democrat or Republican. However, I do believe that we can stand strong as conservatives because I do believe that our main values and conservative values align with the majority of Americans. And if we have a civil and respectful conversation with others and offer them a seat at the table, then we can get through this gridlock. All right, and the same question to you, Dale Crafts. Well, I'll tell you one thing that uh, I think I have a quality and that's I'm a good listener. And I've always been a good listener. You know, I've had many opportunities come my way over the years because if you don't listen, you may miss an opportunity. Well, it's the same thing when I served up in the legislature. You sit down with the other side of the aisle and you're willing to take the time to hear what they have to say. You might be surprised what you learned and how you might move on your position some. So having the ability to be a communicator um, from being doing business and working deals so much of my life and serving in the town council and serving up in Augusta and working with people. I'm going to take that skill and that ability that I've developed at over, over all these years and I'm going to take that down there and I'm going to be willing to sit down with the other side to see if that we can come to a compromise to move this country forward because we're at a standstill in a lot of ways. It's got to stop. You know what? And that's why I support term limits, because maybe there's too many relationships down there and, and there's too much division. And maybe some of them just need to go home and bring in some fresh blood so that, you, that they're willing to sit down and listen and work with each other. All right. And Eric Brakey. Well, I found from my time in Augusta that you can stand on principles and still find opportunities for common ground. So for example, if some if I disagree with a Democrat on 90% of the issues, that means there's 10% we agree on. So let's focus and work together on that. Though I will say in this present environment in Washington, DC, it seems incredibly toxic. I know that President Donald Trump has extended the olive branch to Democrats many times and given them opportunities to work together. Instead, all they've done is pursue fake investigations and fake impeachments. So in this environment, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna stand with President Donald Trump. I'm gonna have his back because it's not Donald Trump that's the problem. It's the Congress that's the problem. It's Nancy Pelosi that's the problem. It's Jared Golden who is ranked the most partisan member of the main delegation who's the problem. So always we're expecting Republicans to bend over backwards and sacrifice our principles in order to find some kind of compromise. I don't think that we need to sacrifice our principles and I'm gonna stand with President Donald Trump. All right, I'm told that we can squeeze in one more audience question if you have very short answers. So we're gonna to try to do that. This is from Catherine Rhoda. She wants to know about each of your positions on climate change. Dale Crafts, I'll start with you. 
Well, listen, I think the science is still out there. You know, uh, we certainly, this country has moved more and more to making things more efficient. And I, I remember uh, when I was a kid growing up in Lisbon, you know, that uh, there used to be foam come down the river uh, through, through down through Lisbon and the Androscoggin River. You know, that's been cleaned up. You know what? We, we can just continue to move forward with science and do a better job. And uh, you know what? It's, it's, it's the climate does change. And okay. I've watched it from the time I was a boy till now. It changes. I think it changes uh, naturally. Okay, Eric, if you could be quick. Thank you. Whatever you think about climate change, we can all agree that we want less pollution. And the way to achieve that is not through government bureaucracy. In fact, when President Donald Trump pulled us out of the Paris Climate Accord, uh, our, our greenhouse gas emissions as a country have actually fallen dramatically since then. It's because we're pursuing the development of things like natural gas. If we wanna become energy uh, uh, independent, if we want to not rely on, on dirty energy sources, I got two solutions, natural gas and nuclear power. That's the only way we're going to get there. Windmills aren't going to do it. All right, Adrian Bennett. Well, we cannot sacrifice our economy due to the Green New Deal. That is something I do not support. We need people going to Congress who are going to advocate against that. that. Um, but, you know, our fishermen, they're a great example of um, how Mainers adapt and they become sustainable to their environments. And I will always advocate, you know, for the common sense. Uh, but something like the Green New Deal that advocates for us not to drive in a place like rural Maine, it just simply doesn't make sense. All right, well, it is time for closing statements. Each candidate will have one minute for those. And this order was determined randomly uh, with names pulled from a hat. So what we found out is that Dale Crafts will go first. Well, thank you. And it's been, uh, it's been good uh, debate and uh, thank you again. You know, uh, when I got a call, you know, I, I, I turned out of the legislature in 2016, went back to my family and my businesses. And you know what, I got a call. I got a call from former Governor Paula Page and Senator Jeff Timberlake. They asked me to consider running uh, for Congress. And I did, I considered running that. And the very reasons they called me is they felt that I was the best candidate that it could defeat Jared Golden in the general election. You know, with my resume and my business experience, my legislative experience and my life experience, I believe that to be true. So I took much time and thought, about it, talked to my family, and I put my hat in the ring. I served with Jared Golden. Jared Golden does not have a, he's not a Dale Crafts. He votes for Pelosi all the time. And you know what, you look at his NRA rating when he was in the house, he got a D. When you look at his um, business, NFIB business uh, administration, he got a like a 15%, I got almost 100%. So there's a huge contrast. And so I am the person that can go down and beat Jared Golden and represent the second district. All right, and second, Eric Brakey. Well, I'm Eric Brakey. It's been a pleasure speaking with you all tonight. I am the proven freedom conservative in this race who gets the job done. I got the job done in Augusta, mobilizing and, and empowering thousands of grassroots people across the state of Maine to pass constitutional carry, reform welfare, and get our health care freedoms back with right to try. Donald Trump needs someone who's got his back in Washington, D.C., who's a fighter. And I'm a fighter. I fought for our freedoms and paychecks in Augusta, and I'm gonna fight for our freedoms and paychecks in Washington, D.C. You know, 10 generations ago, Maine people stood on the shores of Machias, axes and pitchforks in hand, and charged a British warship. They were overpowered, they were outgunned, but you know what? They won the first naval battle of the American Revolution and won our freedoms for us. And every generation since then has passed those freedoms on, the torches passed from generation to generation, and now it's our turn. The question is, what are we gonna do with it? As our freedom slip through our fingers, are we going to fight for a free Maine and a free America? If you'll join me in that, go to ericbrakey.com, and I'd be honored to earn your vote on Tuesday. And Adrian Bennett, go ahead. Well, thank you again, Jennifer, for hosting this debate. We appreciate it. An hour is a long time. And I think one thing's clear through this debate, I'm not the career politician. And Mainers do not want to send more career politicians to Washington. Look who they voted for as their president in 2016. We are a district in the second district who voted overwhelmingly for President Trump. And I see on the ground that he is going to be voted overwhelmingly once again. Now, I do consider myself a miracle to be here. And that miracle wouldn't have been possible without freedom. You and I all know that freedom isn't just a town in Maine, although I did live there. I raised my daughter, Katie, there. It's beautiful. 
Uh, but freedom, it, it's something that we enjoy as Americans and the freedom to own your own firearm to the freedom to work for a living and give people like me a chance at a better life. I grew up in welfare, but I became a success and I turned my life around because of the opportunities that we have. We have radical Democrats who want to destroy everything that I made from. President Trump, he's fighting for the America I came from and the America I stand for. And I'm proud to stand with him. And I hope you will stand with me. I hope to earn your right. vote. Thank you to all three candidates. And that is the final word. Thank you for joining us for this Your Vote 2020 Republican Second District Primary Debate. If you missed any part of this program, you can see it again in its entirety on demand at mainpublic.org slash your vote. There is much more reporting and information there as well. From all of us here at Maine Public, I'm Jennifer Brooks. Thanks for joining us. Local support for this program is provided by Maine Public Member Contributions and by the Law Offices of Joe Bornstein, a Maine firm proudly celebrating over 45 years of practicing law. Maine lawyers working for Maine people since 1974. Learn more at JoeBornstein.com. AARP Maine, advocating in Maine and Washington to ensure Mainers over 50 and their families have a voice on the issues that matter. Learn more at aarp.org me. Memic, a workers' compensation insurance company celebrating more than 25 years of serving Maine employers and their employees. Dedicated to a balanced workers' compensation system that reduces injuries and keeps costs down. Memic.com.